Hello, friends. Yes, I have had a haircut. I'm glad you noticed. I've been working on Domum Alpha's marine ecosystems lately. It's been a process, but ultimately a rewarding one, evolving and describing creatures, noting how they interact, and inevitably, ironing out mistakes. But the oceans are now finished, not just to a level that satisfies me, but one that makes me proud. But I meant for this video to showcase Domum Alpha's entire biosphere, and finishing the oceans took long enough for me to realize that that wasn't going to happen. You 38 years old, how long are you gonna be doing this? Right. So I started scripting, planning for this video to just cover organisms that populate Domum Alpha so far, and that'd be that. But I had another realization, which is why this video is coming in two parts. You did this for what? Well, even with this video's scope considerably reduced, if I did this all in one part, I'd have to condense everything so much to achieve a decent video length that it just wouldn't be worth it. So here we are. In part one, I'll tell you about the major groups of species that evolve in Domum Alpha's early history before a major extinction event. Part 2 will deal with creatures that survive the extinction and how they adapt to the changing world. Before we dive in, let me define a word I'll be using a lot. A clade is a common ancestor and all the organisms descended from it. Clades can contain other clades, as the tree of evolution branches and branches again. For our purposes, you can consider clade a more general term for taxonomic ranks like phylum, family, genus, and species. Okay. Yeah. Whatever that means. There are three kingdoms of life on Domum Alpha, at least as far as I care. I pretend I do not see microbiology. There are Xenoanimalia, Xenoplantae, and Fungiforms. I didn't want to blur the lines between animal, plant, and fungus, because this is my first real dance with speculative biology, so why would I reinvent the wheel having never used it? Fungiforms, as you'd expect, are decomposers based on Earth's fungi. Unlike fungi though, fungiforms are aquatic and don't occur on land. Rather, Domum Alpha's terrestrial decomposers are specialized plants. There are lots of fungiform clades found in different aquatic environments, different depths, temperatures, salinities, amounts of food, etc. The most interesting clade is the Megalobranchia pilium, which I created when a friend insisted that Domum Alpha have giant fantasy-style mushrooms. They feed on the carcasses of huge whale-like marine megafauna, and this abundant nutrition allows their fruiting bodies, that is, their mushrooms, to reach three meters tall. This makes them less vulnerable to predators and increases the distance that their sex cells disperse, so it's actually a great asset to them and not completely self-indulgent silliness. There are three subclades of xenoplantae, or, you know, plants, that photosynthesize using different pigments. Blue indicophytes, yellow chrysophytes, and brown tenebrophytes. I've talked before about why the plants are these colors. Just know that indicophytes are the most common, as they're a bit better suited than the others to conditions on Domum Alpha. While all three clades occur in the oceans, indicophytes are the only terrestrial plants so far, but I'd like chrysophytes to join in later on. The earliest pteraphytes are simple and moss-like, but things get more interesting with the tracheophytes, grass-like plants with true leaves and roots. Those in dry climates are fairly short and are called eusporopratum, while those in more humid climates have competed more fiercely for sunlight, growing to bamboo-like heights. These are xyloprotum. All these plants are broadcast spawners. They just release loads of sex cells into the air or water and hope they'll fertilize by chance. But some tracheophytes adapt a more efficient system where female sex cells are only released after fertilization. We might call these embryos seeds and the plants that produce them spermatophytes. Like Eusporopratum and Xyloprotum, spermatophytes diversify into both herbaceous and tree-like body plans. 
Monoblastobratum are simple palm-like trees that only have leaves at the tips of their trunks, and almost never have branches. While Xylopratum and Monoblastobratum don't get thicker as they grow, Xylobratum are trees that do, thanks to a more sophisticated tissue structure. On the herbaceous side of things, we have those decomposing plants I mentioned that don't photosynthesize. I'm planning to diversify them into all sorts of funky, interesting things. Those that do photosynthesize are in for a bit of a challenge. There are enough land plants by now that much of the continents are covered in dense rainforest, and many of these little plants can't rely on wind to disperse their seeds anymore. However, there are small animals around. These plants adapt to take advantage of them, using food to reward animals that spread their pollen and seeds, becoming the first plants with flowers and fruit. This is definitely fruity. Anthocolophytes aren't the only flowering plants on Domum Alpha. Xylobratum adapt flowers as well, and so does a clade of the bamboo-like Xylopratum. This is an example of convergent evolution, where organisms independently evolve similar traits, and it's not the last time we'll be discussing it. Not only did these three clades convergently evolve similar forms of flowers, but they did so much more quickly than flowering plants evolved on Earth. I am not going to question if that's realistic or not, because I am busy and I'm harsh enough on myself already. Now that's bullying! Did you see that? There are two major animal clades, the radially symmetrical polyplumes and the bilaterally symmetrical bilaterians. There are six bilaterian clades. There are sarcoforms, which mostly look like simple worms, and magnabrachids, which originally looked like segmented worms with wings. Most surviving magnabrachids have more ray-like bodies though, and they mostly live on the sea floor, scavenging and eating coral. There are armopods, similar to Earth's arthropods, with their exoskeletons and segmented bodies. Then there are two sister clades, eustratopods and eurygnaths, which look like weird, squishy lobsters. Finally, there are ramosopods, which are sort of like Earth's chordates. Aquatic ramosopods resemble fish, which is quite realistic. Fish-like body plans have convergently evolved several times on Earth, and are just efficient for aquatic life. There is science, and scientific proof. It's biology. Some of the early ramosopods are the eel-like cyclostomes and the huge filter-feeding tilignaths. Then there are gnathostomes, which, as their name suggests, have internal jaws. But unlike the jaws of Earth's vertebrates, which are believed to have evolved from the first gill arch of our fishy ancestors, gnathostomes' jaws evolved from their scales. See, early gnathostomes had thick scales on their heads and anterior bodies, which fused over time into hard plates called scutes, like crocodile skin. Their scutes merged with their pre-existing cartilage skulls, forming a new skull, pectoral girdle, and internal lower jaw. Gnathostome's armor-like skulls and jaws were based on placoderms, an extinct clade of fish from Earth. Some later gnathostomes develop teeth separate from their jaw bones, and others' skulls become fully internal again, with the head covered in normal scales like the rest of the body. So, those are the six main bilaterian clades, but there's a seventh clade that's evolved by lateral symmetry despite not being bilaterians. Most polyplumes are sessile marine animals. Some look like coral, some look like anemones, some look like bivalves, and others look like giant barnacles. They're mostly filter feeders, but some also eat detritus, some prey on any ramosopods that stray too close, and others have evolved to literally spew their guts onto neighboring corals and digest them alive. Um, ciao. Anyway, so... Polyplumes have larvae that swim freely before attaching to the seabed and growing to adulthood. However, one polyplume clade is pedomorphic, where juvenile traits are retained in adulthood. So, rather than becoming sessile filter feeders, this clade swims freely for their whole lives. These are brachiostomes, which sort of resemble Earth's cephalopods. 
there are two Brachiostome subclades with slightly different body plans called flagellostomes and magnopods. Most flagellostomes swim using their shorter arms, which have membranes on either side that fold in as they pull the arm forward and fan out as they push back, creating a lot of thrust but not much drag. Some don't swim at all though, instead having a more octopoid body plan and dragging themselves along the sea floor. Most magnopods swim by rippling the fins that run down the sides of their bodies and their two elongated arms. However, some magnopods have a different body plan and mode of swimming. Their bodies have gradually grown longer and their arms have gotten shorter, finally morphing into a long tail tipped with a pair of horizontal caudal fins. These bizarre creatures, which look like squid-dolphin hybrids, are appropriately named magnocordates. I have to say, I love the Brachiostomes. Something fascinates me about these animals looking so much like relatives of the true Bilaterians when really they're more closely related to coral. Just like on Earth, animals on Domum Alpha originated in the oceans and spread onto land. Eight or so clades have made this transition on Earth, while seven have done so on Domum Alpha. On both planets, it does depend on how you count it. Some would say 11 clades have done it on Earth, while on Domum Alpha you could say anywhere from 5 to 10. On Domum Alpha, at least, it's my world, my rules, so I say it's 7. Okay. The first terrestrial animals were sarcoforms. Their transition was pretty easy, just going from burrowing under the seas to burrowing under land. Terrestrial sarcoforms, or noriterozoans, are earthworm-like decomposers that absorb oxygen through their skin but need moist habitats to survive. As they diversified, some adapted to live on the surface without burrowing. Some developed stumpy legs, while others developed muscles that suctioned them onto the ground like gastropods' feet. Some of these panozoans even developed shells. Noriterozoans were followed onto land by armopods, specifically by six-legged noristratins and then by four-legged winged noreptoridges. Their wings evolved from forelegs that were covered in long hairs that sensed movement in the water around them. This was loosely inspired by the numerous hypotheses about how Earth's insects evolved their wings. Neither noristratins nor noripteridges can actively inhale or exhale. Rather, noristratins get enough oxygen because their lungs, called book lungs, have a huge surface area. Noripteridges don't have lungs at all, but rather tiny branching tubes that take oxygen straight to their organs. The first large animals to invade land were pteropods, descended from aquatic eustratopods, and pterygnaths, descended from aquatic eurygnaths. In the grand scheme of things, pteropods and pterygnaths are close relatives, but pteropods have ten legs rather than pterygnaths eight, and pterygnaths have four internal jaws forming a cross-shaped mouth, while pteropods have simple external mandibles. Aquatic eustratopods and eurygnaths have cartilaginous skeletons, but both pteropods and pterygnaths evolved extra support when they moved onto land. Pteropod skeletons are supported by strips of keratin, while pterygnates have an outer layer of chitin. Both clades also have lungs, and they can actively inhale and exhale thanks to muscles that work like diaphragms. The sixth clade to invade land were descended from serpropods, those crawling flagellostomes I mentioned. Terrestrial serpropods are called osteobrachids, and while most of their arms have adapted into ordinary mandibles and walking legs, their second pair of legs adapted from the elongated tentacles that gave flagellostomes their name. These legs didn't shorten as osteobrachids came onto land, so rather than walking on their feet with these legs, they walk on their knees, I guess, with the rest of the leg tucked away. It's kind of like knuckle walking that's used by some species on Earth. Many osteobrachids use these legs as weapons for catching prey or fighting off predators. Like pteropods and pterygnaths, osteobrachids needed some structure to support their bodies out of water. 
All brachiostomes have four gladii supporting their mantles situated in an X shape. These are made of calcium carbonate. They're a reduced form of early brachiostomes lobed shells, which in turn descended from the shells common in sessile polyplumes. But osteobrachids needed more support than just these gladii when they came onto land, so some of their muscle fibers hyper-stiffened into a kind of bone. These bones might even be mineralized, but it doesn't matter. Unlike pteropods and pterognaths, osteobrachids didn't adapt active respiration. Instead, their lungs take up a huge chunk of their bodies, which increases their surface area and shortens the distance that oxygen travels in the bloodstream. This is still pretty inefficient though, and it limits both osteobrachids' size and their activity levels. And, well, those are all the terrestrial animals, so that about wraps it up for part one. Join me next time. Wait, what? Seventh clade? What, on land? Oh, well, I hate to be coy, but those animals only come onto land after the extinction event, so I'll be talking about them in part two. I'll also talk about terrestrial clays that return to the sea, I'll talk about flying animals, other than bugs that is, and I'll talk about death. Death to all of them. That's death. The extinction event, what it is, how it happens, and how it affects the survivors. And on, friends.